Well, hello, and welcome to this Facebook Live class. I am going to be doing a Facebook Live for the next three days as part of my three-part video series on self-care for parents who are raising kids with anxiety or OCD. And if you have not been part of this series, it actually just started today. That is okay. You will get a lot out of these Facebook Live classes, and you can still sign up to watch the videos. I have left a link below actually above, morning above, so that you can catch the videos. They're on demand and they're gonna be available for the next few days. But I wanted to come in here and do a Facebook Live so that we can actually talk about these issues further and dive deeper. And even if you haven't seen the video yet, that's not a problem. We're gonna be talk, talking about topics that are very relevant to anybody and, um, and you can pick up where we left off. So today we're gonna to be talking about mindset. When I talk about self-care, I'm not talking about necessarily the self-care that we think about. Um, when we think about self-care, and it's kind of a term that's thrown around a lot, we think of, you know, Netflix. Well, I think of Netflix and ice cream and um, relaxing bubble baths, whatever self-care is to you. But that's not what I'm talking about when it comes to self-care for um for being able to raise our kids in a effective sort of way, especially when they're dealing with anxiety or OCD. I'm talking about care related to parent child who's struggling, a child who has a lot of anxiety or a lot of OCD issues, and a child who, who may even be triggering you and your own anxiety or is made and not on purpose, but it's just a natural byproduct that can get overwhelmed and stressed as well. So we're gonna be talking today. This three-part video series is broken down into three parts. It's mind, it's body, and it's connection. And so today is all about the mind. Tomorrow, if you join me, it'll be the exact same time tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern. We're gonna be talking about the body um, and going into the kind of physical manifestations of stress. And then on Thursday, we're gonna be talking about connection and how people can bring us, can charge us or deplete us. And this is a video series that I've done quite a few times before. I think this is my third time doing it and I'm going to periodically do it because I feel like people can benefit over and over. Every time I do this series, I feel more invigorated. I feel like a better parent because I need the focus on myself as well. Um, there's, there's nothing better than feeling good about how we're parenting and feeling good taking care of ourselves. So if you can leave in the comments, for those of you that are watching live, um, how old your children are, and some of the things that are your biggest struggle, that would that could be really helpful so that I focus on the things that are impacting you. So do that. There is a little delay, and I'm streaming this. For those of you that are private groups, please know that I'm streaming this in, in multiple areas. So this is being streamed on my regular Facebook profile. It's being streamed um, on my YouTube channel, it's being streamed in the AT Parenting community and in the public, pri public private, it's like an oxymoron, the public private group, my Facebook group, my larger Facebook group, and on my page. So um, I will not see your names unless you give StreamYard per permission, and that's okay. So I'm not being rude when um, I don't know how to say hello to you. So somebody has a son who's 13 who has OCD, feel free to jump in there and put what your situation is so that I can understand a little bit more. Megan has a 15-year-old daughter with anxiety, a 12-year-old boy, anxiety presents as anger. How many of you have that? A child who, who has a lot of anxiety and it comes out as anger. I've been talking a lot about that in the AT Parenting community. And I think we actually been talking a lot about it in this public um, Facebook group as well where our kids will sometimes look really um, angry and oppositional and actually it's anxiety um, in disguise. So that is a very common one, Megan. So today we're gonna to be talking about your mindset and it is important because how we view our children's problems and how we approach our children's issues directly impacts how we are going to show up for them. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to just read some of these comments. Um, my daughter is five. I struggle most with her aggressiveness when she's panicking. No diagnosis yet, but it clearly she has anxiety. Um, Naomi said, 
Thanks, Natasha, 12-year-old son with OCD, GAD, and newly diagnosed ASD, anger, and meltdowns. Yeah, I think we all can relate to that. Kelly said, I have a 19-year-old daughter who has anxiety for several years and most recently developed OCD symptoms and hand washing. Uh, my son is nearly 15 and suffers with anxiety and OCD. Women whose intrusive thoughts keep him up most of the night, and he comes and wakes us up for reassurance 20 to 30 times. That's a lot. That's exhausting. Um, he showers for one hour, brushes teeth for 40 minutes. I think he's a perfectionist. I would say that goes way beyond perfectionism um, and, and maybe more into the OCD world, but I'm not here to diagnose. So that thought right there, just showing you some examples of the struggles that that we are going through. So I want to talk about when we look at how do we look at our kids' problems. And I talk about this in the first video. Um, if you haven't gotten the video yet, you can sign up above. But in the first video, I talk about looking at looking at how you view your child's anxiety or OCD. And a lot of times we don't look at our children's issues in front of us, like what's happening in this moment. We're looking at what's going to happen down the road. How many of you do you do that? Where I know I'm guilty of this. I have three kids with anxiety and OCD. And I often am not worried about what's going on right now. I'm worried about what does this mean for the future, um, especially with my son who is 10 and has ARFID and has OCD and thoughts around his food. A lot of times, um, you know, he's not eating. And so it's hard for me to not think about what is this going to look like in a month or two months when his food choices go from here to here to here. It's hard to not um, catastrophe our kids. So um, what do you think are some of the stories that you're telling yourself? And I want you to start to dive deep and think about that. Um, some of them could be things like, my child will never be able to function. They'll never be able to go to college. Um, my child won't ever be able to um, be in a relationship or my child will never be able to leave the house, right? What are some things that you're telling yourself and um, that are scary? Some of the ones that I've told myself in the past um, with my daughter, my youngest daughter, so I have an eight, 10, and 16 year old. And so for my 16 year old, I used to tell myself, um, my child will never will never fit in socially. She friends, she will always be so socially anxious that she's awkward. Um, one of you said, my child will never be able to move out. That's a really good one. That's a good example of, of, of something that we tell ourselves that actually can paralyze us. Um, Carmel said, I have a 15 year old daughter. My greatest challenge is dealing with my spouse feeding off my daughter's anxiety, and then I have two to deal with. And that is a big issue as well. And we are gonna talk about connection in video number three, and I hope that you'll join me for that um, because that is all about who charges us up and who doesn't. And that includes partners because a lot of us, you know, are fortunate to have partners that support us, but a lot of us don't. And we're gonna get into all that in the third video and in the third Facebook Live class too. Um, Yes, I have anxiety and I'm always thinking and worrying ahead of time. I struggle with the panic that if I don't help him now, he's going to go through a lot of struggle and hardships, bullying, getting in trouble at school. Yes, and I think we can all relate. Um, a lot of us genetically are predisposed to anxiety ourselves. So the apple doesn't fall far, as I always say, from the genetic tree. And that can be overwhelming because our kids genetically are predisposed to have anxiety or OCD. And so a lot of us have our own issues, myself included. And it's very hard for me not to take on the burden or the guilt of needing the urgency, like you just said, the urgency of I need to do something and I need to do it right away or things are going to be horrible and we'll never be able to function. And it is important, and this is going to sound very um, easy to say, difficult to do, but it is important to slow that down. This is what I do for myself and this is what I do for the people in my child therapy practice. I try to slow down that panic. And um, I have to almost like mentally sit there and do that for myself, where I say, what is happening today? What is happening in this moment? Um, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, it's good to get tunnel visioned. I just look at what's the problem right in front of me and what's the first goal that I'm trying to establish. Because when we project further out, it parallels us. And then my energy is like, is quickly depleted and then I can't focus on my child because I'm not here. I'm in college. I'm thinking about what life is going to look like in college. And so I'm like, quickly, you know, do this, do that. And I'm, I'm, my anxiety can be contagious. 
um, I also go back in time and have regret doing her in the first place because it's so hard. And that that's a very honest comment. Sometimes, you know, especially in adopt, even our, um, our kids, sometimes we feel like, oh my God, this is hard. And we can have guilty thoughts when we're like, I don't know, I wish, I don't know. I that it was going to be this difficult. I don't know why my screen just went black. So hopefully you can see me. Um, let me see if you can. I was kind of weird. Let me know if you can still see me. I don't want to keep talking if you can't see me that way. But I think you can still see me, so that's okay. And now I can see you too. I can see your comments. All right. Um, so those, you can see how those thoughts can really shut shut down your ability to feel energized to help. And it's, it's you have to caliber all the time. You have to like um, recaliber. I don't know if that's the right word, but I know for myself, I have to reset myself often. And no, oh, thank you. Can see, but it's hard to hear. Really? Is anyone else having a hard time hearing me? That's weird. Well, just let me know. I can see you, but it's freezing a bit. Yes, can see you, Brown goes in and out. That's not cool. Well, I don't like happening. Hopefully, hopefully, because I don't want to disconnect because then I have to reconnect with so many different places. Um, so we'll see. Okay, well, someone said it's getting better now, Jenilyn. It cuts out every often. All right, well, um, it's sounding like it's better. So well, it is being recorded. And my hope is that it will record well. And so if there's any issues, you can watch the recording. But you know, that's how Facebook goes. It's clunky and that's just how it goes. Um, hope it break up anymore. Oh, Naomi's watching from Scotland. That was a terrible Scottish accent, so. <laughs> okay, but if you, if you can't hear me at all or completely dark, just let me know because my social anxiety does not like talking to the wall and then I get really overwhelmed and upset. And I, so um, I'm gonna continue and we'll just start getting something out of what I'm saying. So yes, we want to start to get you reviewing the problem. I know for myself, I kind of myself to worry only about the first um, month of what's happening right now. So like currently I'm only worrying about this, the next 30 days. I'm not worrying about even the beginning of school. I'm not worrying about anything. I'm only worrying about the next 30 days. So how, how narrow can you make your focus and your attention? Um, and that's the first thing you want to do. So the other thing I want to talk about is your own triggers. So for a lot of us who have anxiety, there are two different things, and you don't have to have anxiety tests, but we have our own issues that are our behaviors that have with their struggles. And we also have um, triggers that they create that overwhelm us. So what are some of your triggers? Um, for me, my personal trigger is because that's my own anxiety theme. So I know my own anxiety themes and that to really look into and to dive into when you are trying to work set to help your kids is what are my triggers? And um, I did, we have worksheets in the first video and hopefully some of you have printed that out and have been able to fill that out. Um, if you fill this out and you use the hashtag AT self care and you post it, I am giving a free, I'm giving one of my classes on AT parenting survival um, for free. And those are $127 classes. So I'll mention that at the end as well. But in this worksheet, we kind of go through like, what are your triggers? So share with me what something, it could be either own anxiety or um, child does that just triggers your anxiety. So for me, it's choking. Um, so when my kids were little, I was cutting up their food really, really tiny. And I was probably making them feel anxious based on my own nervousness around choking. And then my daughter started to take medication and um, initially I ground her or help her. My husband had to do it when she started pills because she'd be like, you okay? Are you okay? And my, my anxious energy was not helping the cause. Um, Jenilyn said when someone, when some, when something anxiety producing happens, 
and it spills out onto my daughter. Yes, and that is true for me too. Um, even when I'm just feeling overwhelmed, time is a stressor for me, so that's another one. Um, when I'm feeling rushed, when I'm feeling cramped for time, when I, my to-do list is too big, I am very anxious. And so you're all, and so I know in that moment, it's not gonna take much for me to probably explode. But there are also triggers that our kids do. So what are some triggers that you have observed with your kids that the minute you see that behavior, you're like, oh gosh, not again, right? A lot of our kids' anxiety and OCD can create kind of quasi PTSD, some post-traumatic stress. Um, for Carmel, it's mess. Oops, I keep hitting you and it. There we go. Mess and hoarding. So seeing mess or seeing hoarding, that's a trigger because you're like, I know that those are like beginning signs of some of the struggles that we had. And me, actually, I've been triggered lately, like in the last four weeks by my son, um, because he started to like eat like next to nothing again. And he started to like have like, it just weird or it's just too chewy. Um, and then he starts to eat goldfish a lot. And so when I'm happening, my anxiety is like, and I start to feel panicky. Lori said, yes, I get anxious when I have a long to-do list. I know that's the worst for me. Um, oops. Meg calling me names that he knows hurts me, right? So knowing that that's your trigger, knowing um, going to have a very emotional is so helpful because when we can list out all of our triggers and we can know, and I'm not really a worksheet person, but a lot of people, um, so if you are a person who can write these things down and say, okay, and that's what this worksheet is for as well, um, kind of, I can't remember what I wrote. Yeah, it goes into your triggers as well. You can worksheet, you can print this out. It's below the video when you get access to the video. Um, but sometimes writing them down and saying, these are all and just seeing them in one place can be really because when I know more about what triggers me, then I am able to one, take care of myself quicker. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow in video number two, how to take care of ourselves when we're starting to feel overwhelmed. And I communicate that to my kids. Um, today has been kind of a crazy day because I'm doing this video series and um, I opened up my AT Parenting community this week. And so I was feeling really overwhelmed. And I told my kids because I was being very barky and I said, this is going to be a stressful week for me. I have a lot going on. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff. And so I am feeling overwhelmed. My to-do list is very long. And so I'm warning my kids and that, that does help because my, my 16 year old was like, okay, mom. Okay. You know, she asked me to go do something. I think she wanted to go to Starbucks. And I'm like, not today. And she's like, okay. But see, she's not personalizing it because she knows I already communicated that I was feeling overwhelmed. Um, There's some other good ones I wanted to mention. Um, Debbie said, nighttime when all our batteries are low. Such a big one for me too. Um, I bet a lot of you feel very, very tapped out at bedtime. And uh, sadly, that's when our kids have sometimes the hardest time. Um, and we are really that point. Washing hands. So when you see your kids starting to wash again, that could be very, very overwhelming. Um, Lori said, I get triggered when my daughter tells me shut up. Yeah. So, and a lot of times I think kids with anxiety and OCD, they like know whether they're consciously doing it or not, but they, they know what triggers us. So when they're overwhelmed or when they're upset, they just know where to like, you know, hit you where it hurts because they're so overwhelmed and so out of control, they want to lash out. Um, and it's interesting how kids are so in tuned. My three-year-old is always loud and repetitive, so he'll turn on and off the light switches over and over again. Fan, just watch me. Or he'll pull my arm with his entire weight, almost pulling me down. Those would be my trigger too. Um, sound and chaos is a huge trigger for me. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's a good one for probably a lot of us. I am an introvert. And I like quiet and solitude. <laughs> so I don't know why I had three kids. That was just, I don't know why I did that, but I'm glad I did. But yes, that is such a good point because a lot of the overstimulation can be very triggering for us. The louder people are in my house, the, the worse I get. Um, him being extremely hurtful for, with his words. So this is actually a common theme with a lot of you. 
time. Yes, so much. Also sibling fighting. I feel helpless. Sibling fighting. That's a good trigger too. Not like a good one, but a common one. You guys are naming triggers that I didn't even realize I had. Um, hold on. If I ask him to repeat something he says, he does it more, it seems. Um, when physically hit or kicked by my daughter. So a lot of the aggression is triggering for a lot of you. Overstimulation. Um, I get really anxious when my daughter starts to refuse to go to school in February. Started to refuse to go to school in February. Yes, and school refusal is a very big trigger. Refusal to do anything that we need them to do, especially something on a daily basis, is very nerve wracking. So those are really good examples of triggers. So writing those down and being aware of them can help. And I know that that might seem stupid, but when you're when you're able to see what stuff sets you off, you're able to proactively work on that. So I know like this week was going to be stressful for me because I don't handle fast paced stuff very well. I really like to go slow. And so um, knowing that I'm going to do a lot of other things, we're going to talk about this in Facebook Live number two and in the video series, um, the, the second video, what you do with all this stuff. But you have to know it first. OK, I want to move on to understanding how, um, what other people view your kids and how that impacts you. So this all has to do with mindset because if um, we have our own anxiety or if we are thinking in the future and we never live in today or we have um, family or friends or even a partner who will um, make us feel in a certain way about our kids, all of this, everything I'm talking about, impacts your ability to parent your child in the way that you want to parent them. So how do people's opinions impact you? And I know for me, a lot of times um, I've gone to like well-intentioned pediatricians in the past who have, you know, devalued or minimized my child's anxiety or OCD. I even went to an OCD therapist where I felt like um, my child's OCD was devalued. And that's kind of ironic considering what I do for a living. So what things kind of um, deplete you and help make you kind of second guess what you're seeing with your child. Either you you have a, a well-intentioned relative who's like, you got to fix that, or that's out of control, or that's too much coddling. Those things can impact your mindset. They can make you feel like a bad parent, or they can make you feel like you need to do something more. Um, we're going to talk more about connection in video number three and in Facebook Live number three, but this has to do with how it impacts your mindset. Um, and Karen said, having to let my son know he has overdue homework. I know this triggers his anxiety, so I'm anxious already when I approach him. And that's a good point too, um, when we know our child's gonna be triggered and then that impacts how we're gonna approach them and we walk on eggshells. And unfortunately, a lot of times the best way to beat anxiety and OCD is kind of letting our kids um, kind of cope with these things, these discomfort, these uncomfortable feelings, and for us not to swoop in. And that makes it even harder because then they kind of uh, explode or they have a really hard time. And then it can be very, very triggering for us as well. Okay. So I wonder what are some reframes that you can do when you are thinking about your kids? And we want to go into that as far as the way that you're going to view the problem. So with my child, let's just take my son as an example. I'll go first, and then you can think about this for yourself. Um, my anxiety wants to say to me, he's never going to eat normally. Like, in fact, if he keeps going the way that he's going again, he may, you know, have to be G-tubed. Like, that's where my anxiety goes. My anxiety likes to go to zero to 60. Um, and so then I have to say to myself, what's happening today? What's happening in the next few days? And in the next few days, he's eating. He is drinking protein shakes. Thank goodness, knock on wood for protein shakes. He is eating goldfish and he is trying to eat and he is communicating with me what is causing the problems. Even though a lot of times he won't admit it's OCD, he's at least communicating the problems. So when I reframe it and only look at those things in the next few days, I'm actually feeling better. Like even just saying that to you, I feel a little bit better. That's reframing and that's important. Got some comments. Um, Lori said, I started to embrace rock screen CPS approach, which does not involve punishment. I get a lot of grief from friends for not punishing my daughter. Yes, and that is probably a very common thing for a lot of people that they don't understand your parenting. And parenting a child with anxiety or OCD in general looks very different than parenting a typical child because we might be working on something. And so 
we might be um, like our child might be raging and we might just be like, I know that makes you nervous. I know that makes you anxious. And a relative could be like, he just, you know, said, shut up to you. Why aren't you disciplining that? And you're like, because it's not about the words. He's having a hard time because he's anxious about going to do blah, blah, blah. And um, people may not be aware of that. And that becomes really tricky. Um, Blanca said, my husband's family has always told me that I've oversheltered my now 19 year old daughter with GAD and moral OCD. They've never seen her in a triggered situation. And that's the hard part too, is that a lot of times our kids, um, if they're doing okay, can hide it from the rest of the world. So a lot of times they do look like they're doing okay at school or they do look like they're okay in front of friends and family because they can hold it together for a short period of time. And so that can make you as a parent feel crazy when everyone else around you is like, you know, you just need to stop over coddling. And sometimes even partners will do this where I've seen a lot of times the child will react differently to the mom, um, the mom more often than the dad. So I'm going to make that stereotype, but there are those outliers where it's reversed. And the, the partner will say, I don't know what the big deal is. Um, he always does that for me or he's always fine with me. And it makes the parent, the other parent feel like they're doing something wrong, which is not the case. Sometimes there's just an identified parent that tends to see more of the anxiety or OCD. And that can be really hard. I mean, Ginny said, I get criticized spoiling my daughter when I try to handle her sensitivity. Yes. And I think sometimes people don't realize um, that sometimes people don't realize that when you, when you're acting, Actually more punitive with our anxious sensitive kids they crumble even more and they there's no learning there so like I have three kids and I have to approach them in three completely separate ways because my youngest is so sensitive if I said anything direct to her like you know you shouldn't have done that you shouldn't have said that she will just crumble and she'll be gone for like a day she'll just be like you hate me but my 16 year old, I could just be like, why did you say that? And she'll just be, she's 16, you know, and she's not as sensitive anymore. And she'll just be like, you don't get me mom, you know, or she'll just say something like that. So you have to know your kids and know what to say. And that can be really tricky. Okay. I want to go into some approaches on, um, these are just some like concrete things that you could do to try to help with your mindset. Cause, um, our mindset is contagious how I view the issue is going to impact my kids, whether I want them to be impacted by it or not. And so me being okay and me really working on my approach um, and how I'm viewing the thing in gen, like in a genuine sort of way is going to help my kids. So it's not, it's not like a negative, like I'm wagging my finger at you to say, you better like be happy and be optimistic and Pollyanna or like everything's gonna go bad. It's not that, but it's like, you're not being selfish to get yourself some help. You're not being selfish to really like pause this week and work on, on your mindset and work on your self care and work on how you're viewing things and um, take care of yourself because that will directly impact your kids. I see that all the time in my practice when parents take the time to work on themselves um, and not by like going and just relaxing and getting a massage, but working on how am I viewing this problem? How am I approaching this anxiety and OCD? What's my role and what is not my role? Um, when you do that kind of stuff, you're going to get recharged. You're going to feel like you can handle this and you're going to be better for your kids. Um, I've been told they're spoiled and it's my fault. They act worse than me. That's because I'm so weak. Well, that's horrible. That's Joe. Who told you that? That's terrible. You know, and we're going to talk about this in the third video on com um, community and connection, but sometimes it's not worth having people around you um, who really deplete your battery. And we're going to get into that in the third video. And we're going to get into that in our Facebook Live on Thursday. But um, that comment just reminds me of what we're going to be talking about, which is how to like cut back some of that. Um, Christina said, I do not have a printer to print the form. Um, that is okay. If you want, you can just use the hashtag AT self care and um, take something from the video that you watched and you can post that and I'll, I'll add you into the, um, the contest. I was like, what is that called? The contest. Yeah. I know some people don't have printers um, or ink and so you don't have to show the form, um, but you can just watch the video, get something from the video, your biggest aha from that video, and then use the hashtag AT self care. Um, that contest will go all the way up until our next Facebook live. And then I'll announce the winner 
And so probably about like an hour before the Facebook Live tomorrow, I'll take all the names of anybody who has watched the videos. You can sign up for the videos at the link above. Um, and then anyone who's used the hashtag, a, hashtag AT self care um, and their takeaway from that first video will get um, put in the drawing to uh, get one of my AT Parenting Survival School classes, which they're $127. I have one that is how to help your child with anxiety, and I have one how to crush your child's OCD, and I have one how to crush social anxiety. So there's a couple of different, there's actually seven of them, but those are my three big ones. Um, one of my biggest fails is feeling so depleted that when I'm trying to be firm, I end up crying, then that triggers more. Yeah, and and it's okay to have emotions. It's okay to be human. But I know that like when we get overwhelmed and then our, our kids see us crumble, that we feel bad about it. And so tomorrow we're going to be talking about how to like clue into your body and start to be able to read what, what your body is telling you before you lose your cool. Um, we can't always do that, but I know like I can tell like my heart rate starts to go up and I start to feel like hot and clammy before I'm about to really lose it. Um, and we'll talk about that tomorrow as far as being able to read those signs. Okay, so I wanna go over some concrete things and feel free to leave comments about your struggles with your mind shift or some of the things that are going on related to the topic that we're talking about. So we talked about staying in the now. I talked about, I stay within the four weeks. Um, if there's something really big happening in two weeks, then I stay in the one week. You know, if there's something, something happening in the week, then I stay in the next three days. Um, whatever I can do to not overwhelm myself, but prepare myself or prepare my kids for the future. Um, so staying in the now is like, it's not a cheesy thing to say. It's like a survival technique. <laughs> the other thing is celebrate the small wins. A lot of times with kids with anxiety and OCD, it depends on your mindset. I have worked with parents who are incredibly optimistic, probably genetically. Like I just feel like we're either wired to be um, optimistic, the, the glass is always half full, or some some a little bit negative, like the glass is always half empty. And I see this in my practice, I see it in the AT parenting community, I see it in my Facebook groups. Um, you can kind of hear the tone of the parent, and sometimes we're just so worn down that it's hard to be positive, especially when you've been going through a really rough patch. But you want to celebrate the small wins. So when your child does something small, like I'll give you for instance, um, so when my son today, ate some goldfish and he drank a protein shake. That's a win. I know he got enough calories in the last four hours to kind of be normal. Like he ate, he consumed enough calories that we are like not in starvation mode. We're doing okay. That's a win. So don't forget to celebrate every small win. A lot of times when I'm working with parents who are more on the negative side, their kids will do some pretty crazy things. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, he only washed his hands three times today. Like that's huge. And They'll be like, yeah, but you know, he still has that other problem. You know, he still has to change his clothes like three times a day. And it's like, let's just celebrate the win, right? Let's just focus on this for a second because everybody needs to feel the win. The kid needs to feel the win. You need to feel the win. So um, one of our AT Parenting Community members a while ago, Catherine, had an idea of making a win board. And Miami said, what are goldfish? <laughs> Naomi, you must not be from America. <laughs> they are, were you the one in Scotland? Um, goldfish are, what's keeping my son alive a lot of the times? They're crackers in the shape of a goldfish. I don't know why, but he, kids love them. They're very popular here. Um, Renee said, my son let me clip his nails, took a bath, but put the same clothes back on. It's hard to not focus on those dirty clothes. Yes, that's a good example, Renee. So, but should we... Um, should we celebrate that he clipped his nails and took a bath, right? So if that used to be hard for him, that he didn't, he clipping his nails would have been too hard or taking a bath would have been such a big struggle, but he did that. And I don't know if that's true, Renee, for him, but if he did that and that was an accomplishment, we wanna celebrate that. And we wanna celebrate that Naomi's in Scotland. So what do they have in Scotland? <laughs> I have been to Scotland. Um, Debbie said, it's a small cheese cracker. That's a better <laughs> example than what I just said. It's a cracker. Um, but Catherine used this win board where, you know, and, and I stole the idea from her, you know, and I had one in my house too. And so, um, and Renee said that she gave him a, a reward and that is awesome because let me, let me tell you, if kids are not feeling successful, they will give up. And I've seen that in my practice. It's like, I'll slowly pull a string and I'll start to feel like 
some momentum, some traction from the child. And um, I give rewards in my practice. And so I'm like, you're doing so good. Here you go. And if they feel like it's too hard, if they feel like they're they're not getting far enough and we can communicate that with them one way or the other, they'll shut down and they'll stop working on it. So it's, it's about trying to build that momentum and traction. You're doing so good. Um, there was a time where my daughter, this is a long time ago, she's eight now, but there was a time where my daughter could not go to the bathroom by herself. She had a lot of like poop anxiety um, and she kind of still does. And I had to like go into the bathroom, hold her hand, sit on the stool next to her. Like that's where we were at. And I remember celebrating the day that I got to stand in the door frame and not be right next to her pooping together. Like that was a big win. Um, and now she's actually able to go to the bathroom by herself. And that's a huge win. So it's one step at a time. But Catherine did this re um, uh, reward, not reward, um, this um, win board, I was like trying to think of the right word, where all week they write down their wins, you know, in um, in different colors and it's very uplifting. Now some kids are more private, so they won't like that, but my kids love that. So we would, I would just write, I wrote big wins, you know, what, what is your win? And my kids would write their own wins. And then if I saw something they were doing, I would write a win, you know? And if I was having an issue with my own anxiety, I'd write my win. You know, and I remember I wrote like talk to the neighbor and I wrote that on the wind board. Um, and then even my 16 year old, which is so funny because she's like, what are you doing? That's so weird. And um, Kelly said she lost the video. So hopefully other people can see me. Just let me know if you can't, but I'm still talking. But it was funny because my 16 year old, even she wrote, um, what did she what did she write? She wrote something like, I ate a burger. And I was like, don't make fun of our windboard. And she's like, no, mom, that actually was really hard for me. And I was like, oh my gosh. So even a teenager can really benefit from watching the windboard, not watching, writing on the windboard. I'm watching myself as I'm trying to talk. So um, that's an example. You want to really learn in some way, in some possibility, how to tap into um, motivating your kids, motivating yourself, and highlighting wins in a very systematic, overt sort of way. That is key. So thank you, Lori. She said she can see me, which I really appreciate because I hate talking to myself. Okay, so um, a couple of other things is you wanna be in tune with your triggers. And we just already spent a lot of time talking about that. So I'm not gonna go into that. Know that you're your child's expert. Don't let other people make you feel doubt. There's nothing worse than knowing your child being like 99.9% .9 sure that your child has this issue or that issue going on. And then having someone just tell you, nope, it's not that. And then having you be de depleted. And this happens with pediatricians. It can happen with the school. It can happen with relatives. It can even happen with therapists. Now, you know, you might get a therapist who doesn't understand anxiety and OCD, and they might say, this is a parenting issue. And it's important to, to trust your gut, trust your parental gut. And if you don't, um, go into one of my Facebook groups, go into the AT Parenting Sur Survival Facebook group and post it in there. And you're going to have hundreds of parents say to you, no, you're 100% right. We got it. We understand. We've been there. And so that's why it's really important. Um, Kelly's back. I don't know. Hopefully it was just you, Kelly, but um, it's been a little clunky today. And this was a really good point. We adults need it too. I first learned the wind board through business training. Yeah. Um, wins are important. And so I think that that is something that we, we look at the problem because that's the thing that's on fire, but we forget to look at the progress too. And without looking at the progress, the problem is going to look bigger than it is. And it's going to get overwhelming. Um, Laura said, my trigger is crying and whining. Then I get annoyed and angry, but if I try to leave or walk away, he gets more upset. So I don't know what to do in the heated moment. And that's, that's a common one too. I think that that can get very upsetting when your child follows you around and you're trying to get away and you're trying to leave. And so it's, um, and I don't have a quick answer for that because we can dive deep into that one, but it's okay for them to get more upset. And I'm trying to think if we talk about this tomorrow, but we can talk about it now as well. Uh, a lot of times we inadvertently want to micromanage our kids. Like we don't want to see them upset. And Aggression is another thing. You know, when kids are throwing things or hitting or kicking or getting violent, that's something different. But um, 
when our kids are just crying or they're upset, a lot of times the noise upsets me and having my child being um, uncomfortable or in discomfort can be overwhelming. And one of the things I had to learn to do as a parent is to be comfortable around my children's discomfort. And especially for anxiety and OCD, I had to be them and say, it's okay, we're gonna be nervous together. Um, I had to take my daughter, I had to take all three of my kids to the dentist today. And my daughter was um, really upset um, Renee said it's the hardest thing for me. Um, it is hard for me too. Uh, probably easier because I've been practicing it for a really long time. But this morning, um, we were going to the dentist. They were having a cleaning, and um, my eight-year-old was really, really nervous. And she was she has a metaphobia, and so she was worried that she was nervous, and then she was nervous that she was nervous. You know how it is. It's you panic about the panic, and she thought she might throw up at the dentist, and that's her fear. And so, um, I. I couldn't fix that for her. I mean, we talked about her red thoughts and green thoughts, the stuff that I talk about in my anxiety class. But ultimately, I said, we're going to feel nervous today. Like, you're going to feel nervous and you're going to feel better after it's done. And she's a physical person, so I gave her a hug. Um, but I knew that she was going to be nervous and there was nothing I could do about that. So sometimes it's kind of sitting with that discomfort and just being there for them, which I know is really hard. Um, Ginny said, do you have a good sample format on the windboard I can reference to? Hmm, that's a good... That's a good question. Do I have a sample format? Well, um, okay, I'll give you some examples. So <laughs> these are really weird examples. So I don't know if they're just gonna be a little bit too bizarre for you. Um, I'm trying to think back because I actually took the wind board and then since COVID came, the wind board has become our schedule board, which is so boring and I need to get two boards because now it just says, welcome summer. And it says, we're gonna go swimming at 2 p.m. And um, so my wind board is gone. But my wind board says, um, it did say, like some of the examples were like, my daughter said, um, I said hi to the girl who had a pee accident because she was avoiding her. So it just said, I said hi to, to so-and-so today, which I knew was hard for her. My son would write, um, I was able to eat um, a chewy piece of meat because um, those are their issues. Um, so it depends on, Ginny, what your, what, your, what your child's struggles are. But it's just this whiteboard with um, dry erase markers. It's nothing fancy. Um, I get like the metal dry erase markers that can stick to the board. And then everyone has a different color. And so my daughter could write in pink and she can write whatever she wants as far as what wins she did. We just assign colors and then at the end of the week, we take a picture of it. And then the idea, although this did not happen, the idea was that we would do like a photo album with everyone's wins for the year, which would be a really, really nice, nice idea. And maybe I need to go back and do that because I, I like that idea. Um, Lori said, in my mind, I say over and over again, she's having a hard time when my daughter cries and whines. Yes, I think that's a really helpful thing to remind yourself. Um, I do that too. And this goes back to mindset, to not make it about us, which I know is so hard when our kids know exactly what to say to trigger us and to make us be squirreled, right? Because anxiety and OCD, especially when it's coming out as anger or overwhelm, um, when it's anger, it doesn't want to be detected as anxiety or OCD. And so it will it will try to anger you because it wants to mirror how it's feeling. And when you don't do that, it can get even more frustrating. And so it will, um, it'll call you names, you know, and I'm saying it because it's not your child, really. It's anxiety and OCD's desperation to hide. And so they'll be like, shut up. You're so stupid. I hate you. And they know that can trigger us. If you're not squirrel and you remind them, they are just freaking out because they don't want to go to the dentist, right? We'll take that as an example. They don't want to go to the dentist today. And so they're just really freaking out. And so instead of talking about, you know, hey, don't call me that, or that was rude. You need to watch how you talk to me. Instead, I say, I know you're scared of going to the dentist. I'm going to talk to the anxiety and OCD. And that actually helps me not get sucked in and overwhelmed and angry. Although I'm not Mother Teresa. And so often I don't do that and I lose my cool. Um, and it gets messy because we might have all the intention in the world to be this way, but um, sometimes things get messy and we're not going to respond in that way. And we have to give ourselves some grace to say, I'm not supposed to be perfect and I'm going to mess up too. I'm going to have ugly moments and that's okay. Um, yeah. So Ginny said that. Thanks for the idea. Yeah. I love the wind board. I think it's really, really good. I think it could be really helpful. And Christina says, I 
tell myself that in the hurtful things that he says to me. Yes, and I love that too. These are great ideas as far as how do you talk back to yourself, right? We spend so much time um, telling, well, I spend so much time telling kids, and maybe you do too, to reframe their thinking or, you know, if it's anxiety, what do you, what, what can you talk back to your anxiety? If it's OCD, we just say, you know, that's different. Sometimes I tell people to agree with OCD and um, poke back at it in that way, but that's a totally different topic. But how often do we do that for ourselves? How often are we reframing our own thinking? Um, not often enough, probably. And so it is good to, to start to do that. Um, I want to see if I had any more. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and this isn't a very concrete thing, but it's something that I think is really important, is pick one goal, one goal, and you can partner with your child, do the, you know, Ross Green CPS model, partner with your child and say, what's one thing that anxiety or OCD is really, really robbing you from? This is what I do with the kids that come in my practice. Um, what is, if you could just wiggle a magic wand and get rid of this one thing or this one fear or this one compulsion or whatever it is for you, um, life would be so much better. What would that be for you? And what you're doing in that moment is you're trying to get some motivation. You're trying to get some traction. So they might say, um, I really want to be able to talk to my friends on FaceTime. You know, it's so embarrassing. I get so nervous, but I would really love to do that. And so that's the goal you focus on. You want to pick the goal that's not great for you, but is great for them. If it's a win-win and it's great for both of you, that's even better. But you want to pick the goal that they want to work on because you're not going to be swimming upstream. You're going to be partnering with them. And that's if your child's willing to work on things at all. So pick one goal. And if they don't want to pick on one goal, if they don't want to pick a goal, then you pick one goal. But that's the only thing you focus on, right? So if my goal is to um, just have my child have more protein shakes in the next three days, then that's my only goal. So then when I see him um, eating just a bunch of goldfish and not eating dinner tonight or breakfast tomorrow, um, I just remind myself, that's not our goal right now. My goal is just three protein sh shakes a day. He's not that that severe right now. He is eating some meals. I'm just using that as an example. Um, interesting to hear her anger is the OCD. I didn't think it was her. Um, yeah, anger and uh, ang OCD and anger hide underneath uh, anger all the time. It's a very comfortable place to go. And um, they have, you know, that's why there's that term OCD storms, because when you build up all your OCD and people aren't doing the compulsions that you need them to do and you have all these rules in your head, you can be volatile. Um, and separating that out is important. It helps the self-esteem, but it also helps you as a parent calm down and just be like, this is not, this is not how she wants to be either. And that's, that's kind of the main message for today in general is our kids don't want to be this way. They don't want to, um, they don't want to have these issues. They want to get better and, and us changing our mindset and partnering with them and working on ourselves, working on like how filled up we get. So when we're here, we recognize this and we go somewhere else and we work, work on depleting our, 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 our stuff so that we can come back empty and ready to be recharged again. Um, that, that is the important thing. And Cheryl said, how can we break aggression with a storm. Well, that's a whole topic in and of itself. <laughs> I do. I will, I will link when I get off of here. Um, I have podcast episodes that I've done on anger. I actually have an entire class called difficult, how to help kids with difficult behavior who have anxiety and OCD. And it's like a whole step-by-step -step class. Um, you can look at that at the AT parenting survival. It's AT parenting survival school.com. Um, but I also did a podcast on that and I have a kid's YouTube video. I make kids YouTube videos for kids and teens and I have one on anger and rage and how they can learn how to control it. So that would be a good resource for you as well. Um, if you want to get one of my classes for free, you can um, join the raffle by using the hashtag AT self care. After you watch the video, if you haven't seen video number one, you can go up and click the link above and join. And then I just email you a link. You can watch it on demand. They will be around for the next few days. And then um, use the hashtag AT self care with whatever you got from that video. And I'll put you in a drawing. Normally these drawings are really tiny. So if you like your odds, um, they are normally pretty small. And so um, the odds are in your favor. <laughs> okay, so I have, um, 
I have, I think, just one more thing to mention. So pick one small goal. Um, I want to hear what other people's goals are. So if you can share in the comments before we go, let's talk about what those goals are for you right now. And then if you don't know, um, if you forget or you are a person who gets squirreled or overwhelmed easily, get a sticky note and just write even you can write the goal or you can even write a code word that reminds you of that goal. Um, and I know in the beginning when I was really trying to do this and focus on just the goal at hand and not things that were overwhelming, um, I took like a hot pink sticky note and I just put it on the garage door. This was the days when I would go in and out of my house. Um, now that would be, I probably wouldn't put it on the door. I'd put it somewhere else. Um, but I would, I would put it somewhere where I can remember this is the goal that I'm working on right now. And so everything else is secondary to this goal. And I'm going to celebrate and write wins on the win board for anything related to, to this goal so that my child can start to feel inspired and hopeful because anxiety and OCD is not, it's not, it's not like this, like I have it and now I don't, it's a bumpy ride and it's a ladder. It's like you climb that ladder, you do small things that are difficult. Then you do, you know, a little bit bigger things that are difficult. And then you're doing this that's difficult, but it doesn't seem extreme because you're climbing it very slowly. Um, a goal is to write down my triggers. Well, I like that. That's a good goal for you. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing. Um, you want to write down those goals. Um, did I hear you say the child should, should help pick the goal? Uh, ideally, Joe, yes. I think in a perfect world, and I know we none of us live in a perfect world, but in a perfect world, we would want to partner with our child if we can. And we want to say to them, I want you to work on your anxiety or I want you to work on your OCD. You know, like this is so important because I love you and I want to see you happier. And then you just say the way that I said it, you know, what's one thing that anxiety or OCD is totally ruining for you? That's the first question I always ask in my practice. What's ru what's it ruining for you? Because now it's not about me or what I see. It's the, their thinking. And more often than not, I always get an answer I wasn't expecting. And so, yeah, Joe, if, you're, if your child is willing to pick a goal and work with you, that is the best. Now, if they're not, then you pick a goal for yourself. If your goal is, um, we're going to work on blah, 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 then that's my goal. And a lot of times I talk about in my classes and in the AT parenting community, we talk about different buckets. And so for kids with anxiety and OCD, I always say we start with communication and trust. That's where we start and education. So if my child doesn't understand what anxiety or OCD is, I'm starting with that. If they're not motivated to work on it, I'm starting with that. If they don't trust me enough to share their feelings um, or their issues, I'm starting with that. So that's my first bucket. And then the second bucket is rolling up your sleeves and doing exposures and um, doing challenges and doing good anxiety and OCD work, which normally comes from ERP, which we won't get into. And then the third goal is maintenance. You know, like, how do I maintain this? How do I maintain the health of the family and the health of my child? So these are the three buckets. These are the broad buckets that I work in in my practice. And you might be only in this bucket. So your, your goal might just be improve communication. That might be your goal. Um, Cheryl said, my goal is to have one-on-one -on -one time daily with him. He's 15, so it may include listening to rap music. Well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> That's a good goal. So that might be your goal for the next week or two, right? Sorry. Um, friends around me with younger kids are, are already potty training their kids for success. So I feel overwhelmed and panicky because my son is almost four. So my goal is to have him potty trained by his birthday at the end of next month, but to go at his rate and not mine. And I would say, I wouldn't give yourself a time frame like that. Um, it's a good goal, but make your goal, don't ever make your goals with a time frame because that's setting yourself up for failure. Because he is not going to operate on your time frame. It might happen sooner. It might happen later. And time frames make us anxious because the closer we get to them, the more nervous we can get. So I would say your goal is to focus on potty training. Like that's your goal right now. Um, Stacy said, my son has a fear of throwing up that has led to separation anxiety. His therapist has made small goals for him, like trying one new food item a week with small separation times where he stays home with his dad while I go somewhere for a short period of time. Perfect example of nice small goals. Yes, that's awesome. Lori, my big goal for my daughter is that she watches one of your YouTube videos. <laughs> that's a good goal. Don't let her give me a thumbs down. That really bothers me when people force their kids to watch my videos and then they give me a thumbs down. I'm just kidding. Well, I'm kind of not kidding, but kind of yes. Tracy said goal is to try to get 
testing for tribes would identify more of what we're dealing with. That's a good goal, right? So when you know, like, this is my goal, and it could be a short-term goal, like this is my goal for today or this week. It could be a long-term goal like potty training, which could be like for a month or two. But you know that that is where your energy is focusing. You don't have five different things on your plate. You have one thing you're focusing on. Even if there are other things that you need to work on, you're back burnering them and you're focusing on this goal. She will. She would not have been able to nine months ago. I like the question about what OCD is ruining for her. Oh, this is Joe. Yes. Um, okay. Your video has been so helpful to my son or family. Thank you. Oh, well, I appreciate that, Alana. Thank you. So um, I hope that you have found this first Facebook Live class helpful in this series. I'm going to be doing two more. So mark your calendar. It is nice when you show up live so I can actually talk to you and we can get more out of it. It'll be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, and then it will be Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, same exact time. And you don't wanna miss out on the videos. The videos go much more in depth and you can get the worksheets. And so you can join the, the video series. This is a supplement to that. So you can join the video series by clicking the link above. And I would love to see you over there. They are already pre-recorded. So you, I will email you each day and give you the link so that you can join them and watch them. But don't forget to come over here and watch as well. And Megan said, should our therapists be sharing their goal or the goal they have with my kids in therapy with us as parents? Yes, I think a good therapist should be sharing the goals. And if they aren't, then just ask them. And if they don't have an answer for that, then you need to find, you either need to talk to that therapist um, or find a therapist that's gonna be very specific and. Um, solution focus to give you actual like tangible steps because with anxiety and OCD therapy should be very tangible and there should be very, very goal oriented. Um, thank you, Lori, for coming and um, adding some comments. Cheryl asked, what are the other topics? Um, tomorrow we're going to be talking about how it's all, this is a self care series. And so it's all about self care, not in the way that we normally talk about self care. It's all about self care in, how do we help ourselves so we can help our kids with anxiety and OCD? So tomorrow we're going to be talking more about physical self-care, how to be able to read our bodies so we know when we're kind of feeling overwhelmed, how to take care of ourselves. And then um, on Thursday, it's going to be all about connection, how connection can deplete us or it can recharge us and how to figure that out. Um, and um, that'll be our focus. So I hope you'll join me. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Naomi. I really appreciate you guys um, participating. It's always nice when I'm not talking to myself. And I hope to see you guys again tomorrow. Don't forget to use the hashtag AT Self Care because it would be very cool to see some more people in the contest. All right. I will talk to you tomorrow. Take care.